Hey everyone, in this video, we wanted to share a short target example of how we work within our framework to actually measure the impact of strategy. This video is going to be very important for anyone in a 1099 role or a business owner who doesn't have taxes automatically withheld. All right, let's get into some numbers. So I want to get into what income and expenses are for the purpose of calculating 1099 income taxes. This is going to be the cornerstone and starting point for calculating any taxes you might owe, whether they're estimated taxes or whether you might have a refund. So it can go either way. First, the question is income. Income is usually easy to find, but I want to start with the most complicated version of where your income might be, and that's going to be on a 1099K. So usually when I share this in a webinar or in a room, 80% of people are going to say, I don't get a 1099K, and usually they know exactly why. The threshold for a 1099K is very high. You have to make 20000 in gross earnings and have 200 transactions. So for Upwork, that becomes challenging because oftentimes you don't have 200 contracts that get you there. So not that it's challenging, but that it's difficult to hit that threshold. Now it does get hit. And when it does get hit, the key is to report the gross earning numbers. So box 1A says amount of payment. That amount should match your line one. I was showing them on the other form schedules. Oftentimes my clients say, wait a minute, I didn't earn all of that. I say, I know there were commissions deducted and those are going to be deducted on the tax form, but do not mismatch those because that's going going to raise, I'm not going to call it a red flag, maybe a yellow, maybe an orange flag, maybe it's pink. The point is you do want to match those such that what's on the tax form filed with the IRS, the 1099K, matches the taxes that you file with the IRS, and that's going to prevent any type of letter or questioning. We don't want to be special, right? So I often start there. Now, if you're an Airbnb host, again, this is going to be something that is only reflected if you have multiple properties, really, because getting to 200 stays, that's how each transaction is reported, is going to be very difficult. So what we use when there's no 1099K is we will use the gross payout files that are received from the platforms. This is an example of Airbnb. What you can see in the bottom right-hand corner is a total, but if you looked at that line by line, you would see reservations. You would see reservation at this address, right? And it's actually reflecting how it's marketed. So it usually says great two bedroom apartment by the river, great views. That's not very meaningful to us. What we use is we use the gross earnings column. So that's that far right. And on the whole, this host earned 20,491. So in absence of a 1099K, we would use this file as our gross receipts. The same is true if you are on a platform such as Upwork. So again, we're going to look at the total earnings and we're going to look at that number. So again, back with Airbnb, we were looking at the gross and then we deduct out the Airbnb commission fee. The same thing that you're seeing here on this Upwork screen is you're seeing Upwork earnings and those show about, let's just call it 25,000. And then we subtract out fees You can see there's about 2000 worth of fees for net earnings of the difference. So so again, going back to the forms that we showed earlier, line one would be the higher number, and then we would deduct out fees under part two on the Schedule C or deductions under the partnership or 1120S. So it's important that, again, we're talking about tax projections. Your tax projections should be teed up to look exactly or very closely to what the tax forms look like. So now that we've covered the easy part, we get into deductions. So deductions are critical because that's how you reduce your tax, right? So usually year one, year two of working with a client, the question is, how do I maximize my deductions? And I think that's an important question to ask because it also will give you a very good feel for what's deductible and what's not. And that conversation is one that you'll have with someone like us, but it's also one that you'll have with yourself. And this is where we get into what's considered an ordinary business deduction. And the rules say two things. It it must be necessary for the conduct of the business and it should be ordinary. And the way I interpret that is investing or spending a dollar on X will produce more Y in my business. So if I can correlate that a meal with an investor is going to improve my business, I will write off that meal. If I believe that a laptop computer upgrade is going to increase my productivity, I will deduct that. And at some level, we get to a point where you start saying, okay, well, there's some personal use, there's some business use, and I'll talk 
touch on that in just a second, but the first layer is going to be, is it necessary? That doesn't mean that could you live without it? It means, is it part of input output for me to grow my business? The second thing is ordinary. So I usually like to think of the counterfactual. Is this extraordinary for my business? So if I sell digital marketing or design or video production services on Upwork, does it make sense to buy a truck? Not for that specific business. It wouldn't because it's all digital. Does it make sense to buy a tractor? Absolutely not. That one's a little more clear cut. That would be very extraordinary. So ordinary, I would say at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're assessing reasonableness. You can't get things exactly right, but you can get things exactly wrong. So if we can avoid that, I think that's the principle that we can stick to. So when we're talking about how to tackle tax strategy, we have our principles, right? I'm saying keep things reasonable and we have our rules. So that's don't do the following. So if your business is is Airbnb. I expect there would be some travel. There might be some research involved in visiting other Airbnbs. Should that be 50% of your revenue? It should not, right? Do the rules say you can't deduct travel? No, the rules don't say you can't deduct travel. But is it reasonable to deduct 50% of revenues from travel? It is unreasonable. So it's very important that when you're looking at business deductions, that you're balancing principles and rules constantly. On this next slide, we wanted to demonstrate what business expenses can look like. So what you can see here is we have various columns. They're each important. So we've got date, we have item detail, we have vendor, business purpose, amount. So the rules do require that we have these categories. You've got to have the date. You have to have the rules say the place of purchase, but we interpret that in modern terms to be the vendor and the business purpose. So what did you buy that for? And you can see here, this is expensive explaining what that item was for. So if you take the first example, you can see that it was some kind of pot and it falls into decor. Also important, you need the amount. You have to add these up. And to the far right, you can see that we've come up with a tax category. So that's something that we do for our clients. So we say, if all else fails, write everything down within this format. You've got the date there, you've got the vendor, you've got the business purpose, and you've got the amount. Those four things can defend, and we have used these, to defend audits. As long as they tie back to bank statements or credit card statements, this would be sufficiently defendable in presentation so long as you have a reasonable business purpose. And again, I'm going to come back to this allocation between business and personal. That's where things become a little convoluted because what you have to do is you have to come up with some reasonable split between what is personal and what is business. Now, the rules do say that you can use some kind of factor to do that. So that could be a time factor, but it could also be based on reasonableness. And that's where things become, I would say, too subjective. So what I will try to do is I'll give you some objective rules for allocating things. Number one is going to be time. Time. time is a good indicator for allocation. So for example, if you travel and it's business travel and 50% is business and 50% is not, time is a reasonable allocation factor. The same is true with space. So if you're deducting a portion of your home office, you are going to look at square footage. Based on the square footage, you'd be able to deduct utilities. With Airbnb, it becomes even more specific. So days available and days rented. If you have a personal home that you put on Airbnb in December and you listed the upper half of your house, maybe you live in the basement, you don't get to deduct 50% of the year's worth of expenses. You have to time adjust it. It would be one out of 12 times 50%. And then you could take that as your allocation factor. These get nuanced. So we usually say, give it a try. I've given you a few examples, time, square footage, use is another one. So if we're talking about miles, business miles versus total, that's a good allocation factor. Either you can use direct miles or multiply that towards your actual expenses, including lease, gas, maintenance. Those are things that we assess on a case-by-case basis, category-by-category basis. But it certainly makes sense for you as a client or someone doing it on your your own to have a go at calculating yourself. Again, there are specific rules. Really, when we look for rules, we're looking at what does the code specifically say we cannot do? And once we clear that hurdle, it comes down to the principle. So what would be unreasonable? So if you feel confident on those two factors, then maybe it just makes sense to get a review from an expert. And we certainly do that. We actually run these calculations for our clients at tax projections, but this is probably the trickiest part that I think clients get stuck on. And especially when you look at something like depreciation, 
that's going to be a category that's going to blow the level of complexity up on this. So at some level, it does make sense to get review and advice, though I will say there's no reason for anyone to not have a first go at calculating this out. So that covers the business and income portion of the presentation. Here, we're going to get into some case studies on how to calculate your income tax for 1099ers. So this is super important if you don't withhold. It's super important if you've incurred a lot of expenses. And it's super important if you've earned a lot of income. And here we'll look at an example of a 1099 earner. So we have gross earnings of 40,000. That's up top. Can ignore some of the middle columns. I want us to get very clear on the direction that we're going here so we can leverage that. So earnings of 40,000, expenses of about 3,000. So our operating income at the bottom of that column get us to about 37,000. So that kind of makes sense. So, okay, so we know that. Now the question becomes, well, we can look at tax on a single year basis, but it probably makes sense to look at it the future. So in year two, what do we think the numbers are going to be? And this client says, well, you know, 2018 was a short year. And this client says, well, 2018 was a short year. 2019 will be completely different. And I'm actually very worried about the taxes in 2019. So we say, okay, let's break that down. Let's figure out what expenses we might have in 2019. And conservatively, we came up with something like 13,000 in expenses on 230,000 of income. So it's a very high level of income, very low level of expenses. And you can see here that we look at the operating margin. If you look at the very, very bottom right-hand corner, you'll see it's about 94%. That's a very high percentage for a service business, but it's not unreasonable. And it's a very important metric and something that we actually benchmark. So if you're in this industry and you're a software developer, like the client in this example, and you have an operating margin of, you know, let's just flip this, 6%, you're probably going to get flagged because if you look look at the market for software developers. And if the IRS looks at the industry code that you've put on page one of your return or on the schedule C, and they benchmark that against other industry code filers of the same code, they're going to see a huge discrepancy in operating margin. So, and I even told this client, you know, you're probably on the high end, but it does a good job of demonstrating tax savings because it's going to generate a lot of tax. As you can see in this year, it's going to generate something like 11,000 in tax just on this segment. And that might be manageable. But at the same time, the question is going to be, well, what does this tax mean over time? And in this case, we said, if you do nothing else next year, your tax is going to be 82,000. So eight times what it is in 2018. And a client in this position who has us right there would say, how do I get around this? Or what can I do to improve my tax situation? So on this next slide, we're looking at a more detailed version with a different set of assumptions, but the same numbers. You'll see that 216930 looks familiar. So we look at what the tax implications might be on an LLC versus S Corp. So the big point to note here is we've run the baseline numbers. We've calculated incomes, less deductions, and we've calculated in self-employment tax and federal income tax. And we're doing the same thing here. So you'll see we've got something called payroll taxes. It's the same thing as self-employment tax. And you can see see here that we have an income tax assumption at 30%. So again, 2019 on 216 of income and based on these assumptions, you can look down about five numbers down and you have 48,463 in income tax, 23,890 in payroll tax. Sorry, I did that backwards. So 23,890 followed by 48,463 gives you a total tax of 72,353. That's an ETR effective tax rate of 33%. Now, no one's surprised by that because those numbers are generally accepted. 33% in total taxes. Okay, you got me. So if you said, hey, how much of my income should I be saving? I would say if you want to be really conservative, you're not going to do anything and you're going to sit on an LLC, 33% of your net earnings, that's gross, less deductions, should be withheld. You should put that in a bank account. Best advice I give to people is Goldman Sachs has a 2% earning interest savings right now. Go out and get one of those and every Every time you earn a dollar of net income, go ahead and put 33 cents in that account and see how that adds up at the end of the year. 
But what if you want to do some tax strategy? What if you want to get that number down? And that's where we get into an S-Corp. So you can see in this column, and most folks watching this have already jumped ahead and done the math on this, you would run a salary of 60000 So you say, okay, I will take it on the chops for the payroll taxes on 60 k I will issue that as a W-2. My operating profit is going to be less than 60000 now. So if you take 216, you subtract 60, you'll get to 156. So the total income is still the same. However, you'll see the taxes on this are different. The payroll taxes are going to be that 15% on the 60. And then the income tax is going to come out. I just have it showing as the same. But if you just look at the difference in the payroll taxes, what we're talking about at the end of the day is a delta of about 15K. So $15,000 in taxes saved. Again, we've assumed a high amount of income, a low amount of deductions, but that's just one example and one strategy where we take the principle, how do we calculate deductions? How do we calculate income? And we take the rules around S corporations and we look at what the goal of the client is. In this case, this individual wanted to post high income because they wanted to get a house. So this individual actually was doing software development as well as Airbnb, and they wanted to post high income on their tax return so they could finance a mortgage. One thing for our clients out there that are just want to maximize deductions every year, it's going to hurt you when you go out to buy a house. So it was important that we took the letter of the law as well as the big vision the client had, and we married those two to conclude on a tax strategy, which is an S corporation. You have the tax deduction, you still post the high income, you save $15,000 of tax. At the end of the day, you're going to look pretty good for a bank. That covers how we calculate and estimate taxes for our clients. It also covers some of the strategic approaches that we take to planning and the forward-looking approach we take with clients. If you have any questions, our contact information is up here. Sean at our firm handles all client intake. You can reach him at sean at sharedeconomycpa.com. You can also connect with our company by clicking on the URL shown on the screen or going to sharedeconomycpa.com forward slash get started. Again, thank you so much for connecting. We look forward to connecting on the other side.